Well, good morning and welcome to Solid Rock. It is uh, great to see you guys this morning. Uh, if you are here in the building with us, would you stand in worship right now?
you all join with me in prayer. God, thank you for the opportunity to just be here in your house today. And Lord, even as we just sang, God, that, that you are God that deserves our trust because you have pro- proved over and over again that you are a good God and that you love your people. So Lord, even on the most difficult days, the most challenging of days, God, may we put our trust in you. And Lord, knowing that you will have your way. And even as we open your word today, God, we pray uh, that, that as we go through Colossians, Lord, that, that these would be transforming moments for us. That our hearts and lives would be pointed towards our Savior. Would you grow us today, Lord? We pray these things in your name. Amen. Y'all can be seated. And thanks for joining us at Solid Rock. If you're newer with us today, welcome. Uh, we're glad you're here. If you've never taken the time to fill out one of our connection cards to let us know who you are, we would love for you to do that. Uh, there's one in the seat in front of you. Uh, you can also go right on our church app and fill one of those cards out. It's just really our opportunity to let you know a little bit more about the church and uh, how you can better connect with us overall. If you came prepared to give today, we have boxes in the back uh, that you can leave your offering in. You can also do that right on the church app as well. Thanks so much for those who have continued to support the ministries that are happening here at Solid Rock and as we support our global partners around the world as well. Well, just one real announcement for us today is uh, as we are roaring into summer, uh, we always start our summer the same way here at Solid Rock with our kids camp. And so that is uh, eight days away. Next Monday, uh, June 19th, is our kids camp. We're, we're excited for it. Uh, we got a great group of kids already signed up. You still can register. You can do that right downstairs after church today. If you haven't signed up yet or if you got a neighbor or family member you want to invite out, uh, make sure you do that. Uh, it would be helpful. The sooner the better for us uh, so we can plan accordingly because our teachers are prepping, uh, our music team is prepping, our drama team, they're all getting ready uh, for what's going to be a great four days. Uh, if you still want to volunteer, you can talk to myself. You can talk to Becky Cannon as well after the service, and uh, we can let you know some of our openings we still have. Also, we want to just get on your radar. The Thursday night of Kids Camp is always a very fun night. Uh, we do a big cookout uh, right out on our front lawn. Uh, bring a chair. Uh, even if you didn't have a kid at Kids Camp, okay, you come. Uh, have a great time. We'll, we'll let you on the obstacle course and everything. Uh, it is going to be, it's just a fun night as a church family to all be together uh, on that, that week. So uh, come join us 5 o'clock on that Thursday night uh, for the Kids Camp Cookout uh, and celebrating all the great things that God did over that time. Also, one last thing, if you're a college student, uh, see some college students who are back, just let you know on, on Monday nights, uh, we, we started gathering again, Monday nights at 7 o'clock. Uh, if you haven't jumped in with us yet, come on out tomorrow night. We're having pizza every week, uh, so that's a draw if nothing else. We have a great time connecting, so hope to see you tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. You can talk to me as well if you have questions about that. Well, speaking of summer, we are in our summer series, and our, uh, our team here has got us really set up well, uh, feeling the summer vibes. And uh, if you weren't totally sure it's summer, the temperature in this room today as our AC is on the fritz uh, is giving you a little bit more of that summer feel. So uh, we're glad that you are here, and uh, thanks for joining us as we continue AHA, our journey through Colossians. Well, we are in Colossians chapter 1, so I hope that you will turn in your Bible, di- digital, physical, whatever you got with you. Uh, we're in verse 9. We're going to back up a little bit because we're going to go forward. We're going to go back, but uh, it's because Paul is praying for the church in Colossae, and so we've entitled the series Aha because we want you to understand that it's all about Jesus. When we did the book of Romans... Uh, at the beginning of the year, it was about the theology of our salvation. Colossians, from my perspective, is the theology of Jesus. We want you to dive into who Jesus is, to understand who Jesus is, what he's done for you at a deeper level, that you'll have sudden moments of insight and discovery into who Jesus is and what he has done for you and therefore who you are in Christ. And it'll change the way you think. See, it'll be a catalyst for you of new thinking, and you're going to see that. The Apostle Paul is challenging 
uh, the minds every time we uh, open the scripture here. He says, I want you to think differently. Therefore, you'll act differently. Or you'll live differently. So there's new thinking and change and growth that becomes of this, of the new you in Jesus. I want to uh, back up twice. We're going to back up to our mission statement of our church, which reads, we exist to bring glory to God by making disciples who are conforming to Christ is what the uh, actual statement says. I've tweaked it. I've took some pastoral liberty, if you will, to tweak it. It means the same thing. Who are being conformed to Christ? Conforming to Christ. I want you to understand that this is a process. Those, those of us who are on this journey together at Solid Rock, we exist to glorify God. We exist to glorify God by making disciples. And it's not just making disciples. We're making disciples who are conforming to Christ or being conformed, that you're on this process of changing, of growing, of becoming more and more like Jesus. And as we go through Colossians, you're going to see Paul's uh, impact through the letter to us, to, to the church in Colossae, uh, that he wants us to understand who Jesus is to a greater degree and how we can become more conformed to his image, to be more like Jesus, to be the Jesus that is living in you and living out. And so we're going to back up to verse 3 because I wanted to show you where we were last Sunday in case you missed it, that it, this is Paul praying. We're still in the beginning of the very letter. The, the, this book that we call Colossians is a letter that he wrote to a church in Colossae, the, the believers there in a city, in a town. And so he's praying for them, and it's a powerful prayer. In fact, somebody came up to me after the second service, or after the second service. That would be like in the future, uh, but uh, like in an hour. But after the first service, two people came up to me. One was, we pray that as a prayer every morning, they said. We pray this prayer in Colossians 1. Another person said, I'm going to inject myself and my daughter and in, in in praying for myself and my daughter with these, these words of, that Paul is writing. I said, absolutely, this is a great prayer. And so it says in verse 3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, and so he's thankful for this group of believers, and he's praying for them, because why? As we talked about last week, since we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, and of the love that you have for all the saints, these were people that were known for love, they were known for their faith, and you had heard about their faith, you had heard about their love, he had heard about their faith and love, and he was thankful for that, praising God for that, and he was praying for them. And then he goes on in verse 9, that's where we're starting today, and it says, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. And so I just wanted to like reiterate, everything we're going to talk about this morning is Paul's prayer, that he's praying for the church. And it's our prayer for you, that you would know Jesus to a greater degree, that you would have sudden discovery and insight into Jesus and his, who he is and him in you. Another way of saying an aha moment is that when it comes to Jesus, that we have a true understanding of the value of Jesus. That we would have moments where we're like, wow, I truly understand the value of Jesus more today or because of what God's word is saying to me than I did yesterday. And we would have those moments of insight into truly understanding the value that we have in Jesus Christ. And so, verse 9, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So, everything going on here at the end of verse 9 is talking about being filled with the knowledge of God. And Paul is talking about our minds. He's talking about what you fill your mind with. Last week, we talked about hearing the gospel or hearing the word of God that we what, pay attention to what you listen to, what you fill your mind with. That I said, you are either listening to the word of God or you're listening to the world. The word or the world, which is it? What are you filling your mind with, the world or the word? And so he continues in this vein of pushing us to be filled with knowledge of what? His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And so there's a whole lot going on here that we're going to try to unpack together. And uh, it's that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will, that we would have like mind-blowing moments, aha moments, if you will, of, uh, of his will for us and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. I'm not the, I don't claim to be the smartest guy in the room and don't claim to be the smartest guy in any room. In fact, in my house, there are people that are smarter than me. What is it that 
life is, is about. Is about intellect and how smart you are. No, it's about wisdom. And so that's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about understanding. And so some of us are going to come to conclusions like, I don't understand. And so the Apostle Paul is going to say, then understand more. That's what we're going for. It's like, I don't understand. Okay, then understand more. And we're all at different levels of understanding. We all have different intellect and different understanding of things and experiences of things, correct? And it's not about comparing ourselves one to another. Uh, it's about growing and learning and understanding more. And so I love this because... It pushes my um, thoughts to be centered around the knowledge of his will. The word will here simply means determination. So when, when we say God's will, I want you to start thinking God's determination. Isn't that cool? God has a determination for your life. God has determination for all existence, for eternity. His de- he is determined, and I say it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like God's determined. Like, why is the world falling apart? He's saying, He's saying, no matter what is happening around in us in our world, we can be filled with knowledge of his determination, of his will. And when we live in that, we get little glimpses of glory. We get little glimpses of what like will be when God is on the throne. And we want God to be on the throne right now. We want him to come and just kind of correct everything and wipe away all the tears and the hardship and the pain. And he's going to do that one day. And until then, he's working a process of his knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding in our lives. And so it's also that we can walk worthy of him. Are you determined to do God's will? And here's how it works. There's God's will and there's my will, right? And we pray, you know, our Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? We say, God, I want to know your will. I want to do your will. The beauty starts to happen when we become more and more conformed to the image of Christ as we grow, that we more naturally aren't, don't have this huge division between my will and God's will. And they start to come together that what, what God desires, I begin to desire. What excites God excites me. What pleases God pleases me. And, and as I conform to the image of Christ, more the natural reactions of who I am come out Christ-like. You know, when we poke people, I'm not talking like on Facebook, poke people, uh, or trolling or whatever, all that stuff is. I'm talking about in real life with real people, when, when we push someone's button or someone pushes our button, they know it or we don't know it. It doesn't matter. What comes out of us is what is there. It's what comes out of us is who we truly are in that moment. And, and so we say it comes, instead of it coming out straight, we say it comes out sideways, right? Or we leak, you know, things that, that shouldn't be leaked out, right? Like, oh, I wasn't trying to keep that in, but it kind of leaked out. So uh, this is where we want to be more like Christ so that when, when push comes to shove, what comes out of us more naturally are the things in the ways of Christ. That his will is my will and my will becomes his will. that we grow and be filled in the knowledge of his will. And these are some big words coming up next. In all his spiritual wisdom and understanding. All spiritual wisdom? You see, because of Jesus, you have afforded to you all spiritual women. Wisdom, not women. (laughs) That would be bad. Uh, I don't know if you like Freudian slips or not, but I hope that wasn't one. Uh, All spiritual wisdom is available to us because of Christ. He's at the right hand of God. He's on the throne. He's the one who's in control. He has all the power. He has all the might. And we have access because of Jesus. That when we pray, when we go to him, when we look to him, we gain spiritual wisdom. And not just a little bit, not just part of it, not just all of it. All of it is available and access to us and and understanding and uh, I hope you understand understanding. Like, if God says you had to understand, you'd be in trouble, right? Parents, you, when you talk to your kids, you say, I want you to listen to me, and I want you to understand. You realize you're giving them something they can't do. You're saying, I want completeness and wholeness of understanding, which you, I know you don't have. But what we're saying as parents is we want to be listened to and understood, right? Right? 
But God isn't even saying that. He's saying, I want you to gain all wisdom and understanding. That he's saying, I know it's a process that you're in. And whatever it is you understand now, I want you to gain more understanding. And then when, as you grow in that understanding, I want you to gain more understanding. And so God has really given us some, some really good news here. Um, one of the things that uh, I love about the book of Colossians, this is my own personal take, is that right in the middle of the book, in chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, is, to me, the whole point of the whole thing, that everything ramps up to those verses, and then everything kind of comes off of those verses. And here's what it says, and I get to share these today, even though it's going to take us till July. It's going to be a whole month before we get to chapter 3, because we're going to go slowly through it. It doesn't give away what's leading up to and what's coming off of, and I love that. But I think the whole book uh, pinnacles here in, in verses 9 and 10. It says, you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. And so we have these, this old self, this, this old practice of sin and the sin nature, and it says you have put that off. Well, what is he talking about? Because of Jesus, you are a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. This is a radical thing that happens to you because of Jesus, and we have access to the throne because of Jesus, and we have access to putting on the new self instead of just continuing on in the old self with its practices. And I like to say, uh, quoting one of my Bible professors, you can only, I say it all the time, but it's so true, and this is where, the, this is where it comes from, these verses right here. You can only uh, start, do, if you start, got to stop doing wrong, you got to start doing right. You always have to replace the wrong with the right. If you don't stop, if you don't, if you want to stop doing something, you've got to start doing something instead. In other words, you won't stop doing it until you start doing this new good thing instead. And so the Apostle Paul is reminding us that we have put off in Christ, we have put off the old self and its practices. And what do we practice? Our sin. I guarantee you if someone paid you to be really good at your sin, you would be a pro and you would make millions of dollars. Here's why. Your whole life you've been practicing your sin. This is practices of your whole natural life. And if anybody spent, as, if you spent that much time doing anything else in life, as much as you've put, putting into your sin, I mean, we're so good at our sin, we can deceive ourselves to do something that we know is wrong again and again and again and again. Why? Because we practice it's a part of our natural DNA. It's part of who we are. We, and, so, and so if you put that much time and effort into, say, anything else, you would be a pro at it, and someone would pay you millions of dollars to do it on TV. All right? Now, you wouldn't want to do it on TV because your sin is destructive. It's destroying you. Uh, and God's given you, in Christ, a new self to practice being like Christ. And so there's a put off and a put on. At my house, uh, there are the people who walk in the door, take their shoes off, and put them away. There's the rest of the family <laughs> that just keeps them on until whenever they sit down or where they feel like taking them off, and there they sit. And so it really grates me a lot. But, uh, and my, my, I think my oldest is the only one like me, and she no longer lives in the house all the time. But uh, So everybody else just kind of casually does their, their socks and their shoes wherever they are. And so, you know, some people decorate their house with throw blankets. Some people decorate their house with throw pillows. We throw shoes. And so uh, they're everywhere. And uh, I don't know if you realize this in our society, but we specialize in shoes for everything. We have shoes that do everything, all right? I don't, think, I don't think this is news to you. We have shoes coming out of our ears. There's shoes everywhere because we specialize in every kind of shoe. In fact, this morning I'm wearing my preaching shoes. You, if you see me wearing these shoes, I'm preaching. And if, if <laughs> they're so specific that they're actually summer preaching shoes. <laughs> if you, you will not see me wearing these shoes in the wintertime preaching only in the summer. And so we have all 
sorts of shoes. If you're, if you're going to walk worthy of God, then you've got to put off the wrong kinds of shoes and put on the right kind of shoes. If, 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 if I were to go for a serious hike in the woods, I would not wear these I might wear these shoes up here like we got on stage. Uh, Not specifically these shoes because I think they're a little small and they're probably women's, but (laughs) these are the right kind of shoes for the trail. They got a good grip. They got good support, and you, you actually have to lace them up, right? These are appropriate shoes to wear if you're going to hike a mountain or if you're going to hike on a trail uh, and not fall down, all right? And so you want to be, you want to be wearing the right kind of things. The, the scriptures tell us that beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. God's telling us something about our feet and our footwear. And when he says, walk worthy of the Lord, look at verse 10. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in, here it is again, the knowledge of God, growing in the knowledge of God. But the command and the imperative of, of this portion of the prayer that he's praying for the church, and we're praying for you, is that you would have a, a strong mind, that's what he was talking about before, that your mind would be growing and increasing in knowledge and all spiritual wisdom and understanding that your mind would be growing in those things so that you can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. The idea here is uh, just to do it, to do what it is your mind has been preparing you to do. Remember Nike's great slogan, since we're talking about shoes, just do it. Terrible slogan. I mean, beautiful slogan. In fact, they convinced millions of people to buy millions of pairs of shoes, and they made millions and billions of dollars off of it. But it's an absolutely terrible slogan because it's not even true. Nobody just does anything. You prepare for it. You think about it. You, you eat for it. You train for it. Then you do it. Nobody wakes up in the morning 100 pounds overweight or 50 pounds overweight or 20 pounds overweight and says, I'm going to go for a run. The Meek family, you guys are big runners, right? There's a little more involved, isn't there? You don't just get up and go for a run. Nobody, nobody even feels like going for a run. <laughs> if you feel like going for a run, you've prepared your mind, you've prepared your body, and you've prepared your calendar, and you've told yourself, and you psyched yourself up, and you said, I'm going for a run. And everybody's like, go for it, you know? I'm running to, I'm running to the fridge, and... That's as far as I go. I don't run anywhere, but I like to walk. And it's more spiritual, apparently. It doesn't say, <laughs> it doesn't say run in a manner worthy. Actually, it does. In other texts, it does. So it can be running. This is, all. This is, this is, a, uh, this is just a, a, an example of life, right? This is just a metaphor for life. This isn't actually physically walking, but this is spiritually walking with the Lord, And so we're to do it in a manner that is worthy. We are to think about it, prepare for it, and then do it. Do it. So it involves the word of God. It involves prayer. It involves the spirit of God. And as you're going to see in a minute, it involves the power of God to do it, which is amazing because you can't do it in your own power. Walk in a manner worthy. You can walk places, but you can't. You can live life however you want to, but you can't live a life that's pleasing to God. You can't live a life that's worthy to the Lord. You can't be this sweet-smelling sacrifice that Paul tells the Ephesian church to be, that our aroma of our lives would be pleasing, a sweet, pleasing to the Lord. But we're to walk in a manner that's worthy. In other words, you can walk in a manner that's not worthy. It's implied here. So it involves preparation and prayer and and truth in the word. And it involves Jesus and his spirit and his power in order for you to do it. Do it. So don't just do it, but do it. Do it because you've prepared for it. You've talked about it. You've thought about it. You've prayed about it. You've read the word about it. And you ask others to pray for you. And you're doing it in community with other people and with the Lord. So how do we walk worthy 
Well, in the context here, there's three ways. We, we're pleasing God, we're bearing fruit, and we're increasing in knowledge. Now, pleasing God just implies, well, it's not about me. It's not about how I feel and what I want to do. It's about what, what God wants me to do. It's apparently about doing the work and the will of God. He's already said the be determined to do the will of God. And here, bearing fruit is the work of God and bearing fruit because you're doing the work of God. And so we do the will of God and we do the work of God and we bear fruit. It's interesting because uh, last Sunday when we talked through the first eight verses, so I think for maybe like verse five or six somewhere, it says this same idea of increasing in fruit or bearing fruit, but it's not talking about us. It's talking about the gospel. The gospel, he's, Paul says, is bearing fruit in you, he says to the church, and to the whole world. It's not just you, but the gospel is bearing fruit in the whole world. And here, he's not talking about the gospel bearing fruit. He's talking about your walk bearing fruit, that you're you're pleasing the Lord and you're walking with him in a way that does his will and his work, and you get results. You see, in Jesus, because of Jesus, I can live a life pleasing to God. I can please God. You can please God because of Jesus. We can live lives that bring him glory. We can actually do it. We can please God by living a life that is worthy to him because of Jesus. And we can see results through what we do in Jesus. Results that are going to impact my life today, my kids, my spouse, my grandkids, but into eternity, we can see results and bring glory to God. We can bring glory. You can bring glory to God. You can please God. You can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. But you can't do it on your own. And you can't just get up and do it. You've got to think about it, pray about it, talk about it. You need community to do it. You need the Spirit of God to do it. And most of all, you need the power of God to do it. But in Jesus, you have been given access to all spiritual things, all spiritual understanding, all spiritual wisdom. It's pretty amazing. And so, Thirdly, we're to increase in the knowledge of what? Of God. And so whatever you know about God and whatever you think you know about God, Paul is saying, if you're going to please the Lord and walk in a worthy manner worthy of him, you're someone who's increasing in the knowledge of God. Do you ever feel like, eh, I kind of know it all? <laughs> you're, not, you're not 18 anymore. <laughs> no, di- real, seriously. Even as, a, even as a full-grown 40, 50, 60-year-old adult, guess what? There are times where we really think, I, I've got this down. But that's not where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be honest and say, I'm not God. And I know God has so much more than I can even imagine. And I want to I know that. I want to increase in the knowledge of him. I want to learn more, and I want to understand more. About God. Don't ever stop. Don't ever stop increasing in knowledge and in experiential knowledge of God and, and also mind knowledge, book knowledge, Bible knowledge. Don't ever stop. Don't ever stop. This is how we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Verse 11 tells us how we're going to do it. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. There's a lot going on here in one little verse. The first thing is that you get to be strengthened with all power. That if you're going to walk, walk strong. And if you're going to walk strong, that power comes from God in order for you to do it. I have constant health issues, but one of the things that I do to evaluate myself as to how I'm doing physically is I measure how much I get to walk physically. And there's been days where I'm like, I can walk down the driveway, and I'm so exhausted, i got to turn around and come back. That's not a fun place to be. 
But there's days where I can walk 10 minutes. That's one little loop around the neighborhood. I can go into the next neighborhood and do 30 minutes. But if I'm really feeling good, I get to a 45 or a 60-minute walk. And you know where I am? I'm in the woods, baby. (laughs) I made it out of the concrete jungle (laughs) and into the woods. And when I'm able to do that on a regular basis, I know I'm doing really well physically. When I'm able to walk that kind of walk. And the real, the real testament for me is like, you know, I come, I come away after the walk and, and do, am, I, am I doing better or am I paying a price, right? And can I do that consistently? And here's the thing. This is not a physical thing that God is talking about. It's not physical at all. You can't even do it. You can't even measure it the way you would measure something physically, but it's spiritual and it's a spiritual walk and he's saying to you, I will strengthen you with all power. Power from God to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing the Lord, according to his glorious might. The the words glorious might are are huge. The word might, when when it's talked about God, it's, you know, he, he talks about Jesus being at the right hand of the Father. It's a place of power. Sorry for all the left-handed people. But there's power in the right side, all right? And so all the right-handed people get it because that's, that's where all our power is. But Jesus is the right hand of the Father, and, when, and he's giving us his glorious might that, that he is upholding us, it says, by his mighty right hand. All through the scriptures it says that. He's upholding us by his mighty right hand. The word might, when it refers to Jesus as the mighty one in Isaiah, prophesied, the mighty one. It literally means the hero that is God. It's amazing. This is all the superheroes combined into one that we can even imagine or exist. He's the hero that is God. He's that mighty. And it's glorious might. It's might that... That takes care of the past. It's enough power for my past. It's enough power for my present. And it's enough power for my future all at the same time. You say, I'm hung up on my past. I'm stuck in my past. It's power for your past. You say, I'm stuck in my present. I'm overwhelmed. Things are so hard. Things, you don't know what I'm going through. Things are so difficult right now in the present. It is glorious might for your present. Say, I'm afraid of the future, and I'm afraid what's coming. I don't know what's coming down the road, but it looks bleak, and it looks glim. It's power for the future, and it's not just power for your past and the present and the future. It's power for all of it. It's glorious might. It's glorious might that sustains you and empowers you to live the eternal life right now here today and walk in a manner worthy of the Lord right into eternity. If we're going to be, if Jesus' work on you is to be determined to make you, to conform you to the image of the Son, right? That's what what he's going to do when you get to glory, when when you die as a believer in Jesus Christ, he's going to finish his work. We need to be determined that he doesn't have to finish a lot or too much, right? Because otherwise, because you're supposed to walk into it, Right? But if you're walking and all of a sudden you die and you still have a long ways to go to become like Jesus, you're going to start flying really quick. I mean, that's the way I picture it. You're going to walk, walk, and then you're bam, <laughs> came like Jesus. But you had so far to I don't want so far to go. I want to continue to grow today, tomorrow, the next day so that I'm becoming more like Jesus. For all endurance and patience with joy, we obviously need endurance. We need to keep going. We need strength to keep going. Because this world is hard and this world is difficult. And we only get glimpses of glory here today. We, but God gives us glimpses where we see, like, wow, that's amazing. God is amazing. We get glimpses of glory, and we have to hold on to those. Because like the church in Colossae, they had, they had hope for the future. They, they rested in it. They were empowered by it. They were excited about it. They were known because they really believed that God was going to be on the throne and we're going to have eternal life. He's going to right all the wrongs. He's going to give us wholeness and completeness. And so no matter what it was that we're, we're going through, it doesn't compare. 
doesn't compare to then. So we keep going and we persevere and we endure and we have patience with joy. The word patience is just terrible, right? Here's the deal about patience. You don't think about patience until you are failing at it, right? And when we fail at it, 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 that's when the things go sideways and we're just not patient. I mean, uh, as Americans, we're not patient. We expect things to happen overnight. We like lines to go fast, right? Have you heard any honking lately? We, we, like, we like it when the light turns green that the person at the light who's first in line goes, <laughs> right? That's what we like. And when, when, when they don't go, we honk. Eh, 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 you. And what we're, so I, I have to apologize to the second service because I called everybody an idiot last week. I hope you understand that was facetious <laughs> and, uh, and, and that you know, what I was saying is we get frustrated with the person next to us, the person in our homes, the person on the road. We get frustrated. But so I'll give you, I'll, I'll call, so I'll give you something separate, something diff- different today than an idiot. But when, when, uh, when you, people are, people are on their phones. Okay, first of all, it's illegal. But second of all, it's moronic, all right? And please don't do it if you're, Please don't do it. But we, we, we honk at those people. And what we should be doing is like, honk, 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 honk. Get off your phone. And what should be followed and implied in our minds is moron, <laughs> right? Because it's moronic. But uh, we'll keep that to ourselves because we're trying to be spiritual about it and we're trying to be patient and we're not patient. But to be patient, uh, if, it, you know, if you're struggling with patience, with joy, what? Patience with joy? Where do I, I don't get to use my horn with that. Or maybe I am using my horn. Da, 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 another person's on their phone. I don't know what you're doing. But um, celebrate it however you have to and have joy. But the word joy literally means three things as, as we look it up in the original language. Hope, calm, and delight. And so it, it's a reference. This joy is a reference to the hope that we have in Christ. Again, that we, look, that we have a future glory like this person that's bugging me right now, you know, that's no big deal in the light of eternity. And so there's probably bigger problems that we have to deal with. But uh, the word calm, you know, you, you remember the whole thing was popular, like keep calm and do whatever, right? <clears throat> keep calm. Uh, it's, it's stolen from this, this word here of joy that the idea is that joy, we should have a calmness. It should bring a calmness to us that we're patient and we're calm. Nobody's, nobody's uh, wired and, and ratcheted up to be calm. Uh, they're ratcheted, we're, all, we're all ratcheted up to be frustrated and intense, right, and angry. But uh, with, the, with Christ, the, the difference that Christ makes for us and the power that he gives us to walk in this is that we get to have patience with calm. And the final word, delight, is a great description of joy that we could delight in even the morons, you know? We can delight in any moment because we know that God is bigger and God is greater and that we have joy, that we can stay hopeful and have calmness and delight in who Jesus is and the strength that he's going to give us to endure the things of this world that are hard to endure. Verse 12 giving thanks to the Father. And so Paul's sort of wrapping up his prayer here. He's giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So here in verse 12, we see Jesus formally introduced in the letter. He's been informally introduced. He's been implied But here we see in verse 12, it's no mistake who he is talking about. He's talking about Jesus, the beloved son. And because of the beloved son, we can give thanks to the father because he qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Why? Because of Jesus. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. You are now a child of God. 
And when God looks at you and sees you, he might see, you know, a kid who's not listening, who's not understanding, who's way far away from completely and wholly getting what you're saying to them. But he says, I love you because you're my kid. You're my child. And Jesus made that possible by going to the cross and paying for our sin. But not only that, we get to share in, in the inheritance uh, the inheritance that Jesus has as a, as a beloved son. He's the beloved son. We get to become beloved sons and daughters of God because of Jesus. And therefore, we get to share in his inheritance, which is amazing. And he delivered us from the domain of darkness, which is awesome. And he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. We are now in the kingdom, working for the kingdom, living for the kingdom. We're to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord who's given us the kingdom. All glory and honor and praise to him. The word worthy shows up in the book of Revelation. What we're hoping when, when Christ comes on and rules the earth, and it says this, worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Who was and is and is to come. And they repeat it over and over. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. And if he is worthy, then he is worthy of us walking worthy of him. Verse 14 says, In him we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. This clarifies where all of this uh, comes from, that Jesus has made it possible for us to be redeemed, to be bought back, to be paid for in such a way that we are given life instead of death in the forgiveness of our sin, that we can put off sin and its practices and we can put on Christ. So our aha moment today is to do it, to put it off and put it on. And Jesus, you can live a life pleasing to God and see results from what you do for him. Glory to God. So let's do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word that tells us who Jesus is and then that tells us who we are and that we get to be beloved sons and daughters of the Most High God because of what Jesus did for us and going to the cross and redeeming us and forgiving our sins, rising again, giving us eternal life, but giving us power to live today, giving us the strength to walk in a way that is pleasing to you, God, and that we would do that increasing in our knowledge of you, increasing in the fruit that we bear for you, and increasing in uh, the steps that we take to put off the old self and its practices and put on, put on Jesus, that we be conformed more and more to the image of your son. And so we thank you and we praise you and, you and we ask you to help us not only hear from you what we need to hear, but then when you tell us your will and we get our lives in line with yours, that it would be more and more natural to do it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you guys stand and worship with us?
week one last Sunday. Hear it if you don't hear the word of God. Week two, you can't do it, so you need to hear it and do, in order to do it. We're asking if you if you miss a Sunday as we go through Colossians. I mean, two weeks, we're, we just got through the first 14 verses. Dive in with us. Read it on your own. Uh, if you miss a Sunday or if you're away out of town, tune in, watch online. You're not going to want to miss next Sunday. We talk about the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Have a great day.